Joining us now, we're going to talk with Bianca Goodlow. She's managing partner of Goodlow Law and Kinds Global. She provides clients with experience in film finance, entertainment law, and intellectual property and development and production of films. They have offices in Los Angeles, New York, London, and Dubai. Wow. Dubai soon to be. Oh, Dubai soon to be. <laughs> well, we're, th- we're, we're, we're being proactive. Yes, we are. Um, well, that would be exciting. Yeah. Dubai is kind of cool because, I mean, you fly over and then di- didn't the, the sultan or is it sultan of prince or Dubai, didn't he like create cities that spell out his name or something? Maybe you're thinking of Brunei. Mm, I sultan. don't know. <laughs> well, or no. Nevertheless, well, a lot guy- is going on in Dubai and Abu Dhabi especially for, yeah. for film financing reasons. So, you know, you go where the action is. And you, you do go where the action is. I mean, your client list is the who's who of, uh, of Hollywood pretty much, isn't it? Well, some we can talk about, some we can't. Oh, oh, it's very... Well, I just played music from The Informant, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so who knows? Uh, a great Marvin Hamlish uh, score. But anyway... Uh, well, part of the practice is talent-related. Yeah. And part of the practice is um, investor-related. Now, what attracted you to... Uh, when you were growing up, you wanted to obviously be a lawyer, right? No. You didn't. Of course not. Who what? wants to be a lawyer? Well, that's what Come I was on. thinking. I was thinking about that. I go... I go <laughs> You know, when I was growing up, what did I want to do? I just wanted to, like, you know, go to the beach, you know, yeah, go with that girls was me. and, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was in for the beach, um, not the law necessarily. The people that I know that grew up wanting to be uh, lawyers are, for the most part, litigators. So I don't uh, litigate. I'm a transactional attorney. And uh, I, I went to film school like all most film lovers. And um, my intention was to become a producer. And I spent some time working um, as in development and got knocked around a little bit, which very quickly made me realize I have to learn my rights. And where do you go for that? Law school. And then the rest is history. You, you get out of school. They start throwing a little bit of money at you. You take the job. And then you're in. Well, now, uh, there's also a value for this, doing this type of job. It's not just for the money, right? Or was that the main motivation for you? Well, at the very, very beginning, I thought I'd give law a couple years just to kind of cut my teeth on it, always with the intention of going back to uh, producing and, uh, you know, getting as close to the film world as possible. Um, And, uh, well, that's not exactly how it worked. But I did find um, my, my first job. I was working for a film finance group for a British law firm called Linklater's. And uh, the first film that they staffed me on, it was a small team of about five of us. Um, that film happened to be Harry Potter 2. And so we did the, the financing side and the distribution side of that. And um, the next film was The Lord of the Rings. And the next one was Lara Croft, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So, you know, once you kind of get immersed in the business and to that degree with that caliber of film, you say, all right, well, this is kind of close enough. I, I kind of like this spot. I might stay here. And that's where I've stayed. Well, in addition to the big features, you've also worked on some smaller films, uh, The Life of David Gale. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Very interesting film. Yeah. And and smaller budget films from that um, in the last several years. I've, I've refocused from exclusively studio side films to the indie side because I think that's really much like what's happening in the TV world. I think um, that's the equivalent of cable where the sexy happens. So in terms of film financing, I think that there's more flexibility and there's a lot of action that happens in the indie world that's going on right now in Toronto and other festivals uh, across the world around the year. Is there a specific project that you like to work with? Hmm. Well, because my background, I'm a, I'm an EU attorney as well as a U.S. attorney, so I appreciate um, cross-border transactions, meaning co-productions, international co-productions. Um, for me, that has to do with some you know, technical aspects I'm not going to get into, but it th- for attorneys, that's the sexy. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, um, the result from that is also it, it commonly builds a more interesting product. You know, the the resulting film is, I think, um, more complex, and I think it appeals to broader audiences, which is always the goal. Do you take in some ways uh, ownership on the project? Because <laughs> like, I kind of get that when you, when you talk, that if the project has a little bit more substance and meaning to you, 
does that equate more success for you when it does hit the mark? Well, I, I do have a boutique practice, so we have a, a finite amount of bandwidth, and I am finicky about the projects that, um, that we represent um, for several reasons. Um, I do like this field that I'm in because I guess I, I get to take a little bit of ownership in the fact that I have a say on, okay, filmmaker, this is what you can afford uh, because this is the casting that can support the pre-sales that we need to get the debt piece to be able to, or another example is this is where you can shoot because this is the tax credits that we need to qualify for. And this combination of locations will allow you a net present value that can be monetized in advance by tax credit brokers, etc. And all that mumbo jumbo um, does have an impact creatively on the film and on the process. So to that degree, I, I take some ownership. And um, mostly I just take great pride in my clients and the filmmakers. I would think that sometimes you get these, you know, the filmmakers, they've got this great idea for a movie, but they're, they can almost be like a lamb to the slaughter if they don't, sometimes. If, they don't have, <laughs> if they don't know the ins and the outs of the financing, because you kind of have to wear different hats. You yeah. know, if you're, you're either a creative or you're a financier, yeah. right? But it's nice that you went through that experience. So you can kind of navigate that landscape with that understanding of what it's like to be on both sides. Certainly, yeah. And so filmmakers, lambs to the slaughter, but also when you're dealing with talent that is, there's a new trend, uh, most notably with Magic Mike, of of the talent financing the films themselves. And uh, sometimes passion overtakes pragmatism. And that's when I need to reel the clients back in that respect. Or uh, conversely, when I'm representing the passive investors, um, they are passionate about a project that in, in no way can I conceive of making it sustainable and sufficiently risk mitigated. So I spend a healthy portion of my time talking them out of deals <laughs> as opposed mm. to, um, you know, talking them into deals. Does that ever come back to haunt you if you, if you don't persuade them enough? Or let's say that you've taken those projects where I don't think this is going to recoup the money. Yeah. Well, it is not always about there's only so much you can do um so you know i can draw a line in the sand and say i think this is a, a a terrible idea for the result that you're looking for and hopefully that they'll listen but not every investor is financially motivated um there is a value added to this as they call it the you know the red carpet sizzle the, that's you know the sexy for certain it's investors. an ego-based business yeah, it's, too. it's the affiliation to stardom it's the spectacle it's the the heightened sense of creating art, you know, whatever it is, it's, there is a class of investor out there that wants to diversify their portfolio and either they're going to invest in art or in, in a vineyard or, or in a film. And they, you know, allocate certain funds for that come, come hell or high water, regardless of what the financial result is. It's the experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, so far I don't have any unhappy clients. So <laughs> where is your spectacle with this process? How do you mean? Well, you know, some people go and they invest in, mm. you know, they invest in the film for that. Maybe it's not for the financial reward, but it's for that red carpet. Right. What would be the equivalent of your red carpet? That is a great question. Um, I think I, I'm very drawn to uh, filmmakers that sometimes get caught in the maelstrom of Hollywood. And uh, if I read something that really takes my breath away, I happen to be married to a writer, obviously. So uh, that's that's my not so big secret secret. Um, I love a good script and I love a good writer that can then translate that into maybe being a good director and, and, you know, elevating something that comes from an idea or a book. And then I can help encourage that and nurture them to turning it into something that is a spectacle on the screen. I think that's really where my fulfillment comes in. What, uh, currently now, Toronto's happening, but I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things. Uh, some of the new projects that you're working on, um, uh, Al Pacino Salome. Yes. Yeah, I actually saw the production. <laughs> I saw you the did. production at UCLA. Okay. What was that? Uh, it was at a small theater right off of uh, Wilshire Boulevard. It's the the VA, where the VA is. Yeah. They have a theater there, so he presented it. Yeah. Man, that's such a great... <laughs> and he was perfect. He yeah. was perfect for, you know... Um, well, I mean, he is the ultimate ringleader. Yeah. I mean, he's... And he's done but it he's all. he's all over the map. When you hear the guy talk, yeah. he's all over the... But I think that's the way actors are. You know, yeah. They, they give him a script, and you just go, wow. 
Yeah. But yeah, well, I mean, that, it's that's an incredibly an exciting... personal film to him. You know, it's his, it's a docudrama that explores his personal obsession with this one play and the impact that it had on the characters and on his life. And, you know, he's been performing a certain play for some time now, several years. So your relationship with it changes as, as your perspective on life changes. And, and that there have been several cuts several different edits and versions of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, it's been a long time in the making, and that's what makes it so special because it's it's changed as he has changed um, in the time that I've been involved with the project. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing big things come of that. So it's like a play within a play. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Um, you're also working on a Linda Lovelace story? Yes, um, that is... What a tragic character she was. Yeah. Uh, there was actually a couple of years ago they did... Um, it was a documentary about the making of Deep Throat. Mm -hmm. And what was funny, because I was at the theater, went to a screening, and they were also screening Matthew McConaughey's Sahara. Mm -hmm. And so came out of the screening, and it was uh, at one of these fourplexes, uh, uh, the Chinese theater. And I'm waiting for my ticket, and I heard these people talking about, oh, I, was, I really enjoyed the movie. I go, oh, you liked it? They, yeah. There just wasn't enough action. And yeah. they were talking about Sarah. <laughs> I, oh, no. I, I, was, I thought they were talking about uh, <laughs> about the Deep Throat film. <laughs> so it was really interesting. So uh, that sounds like a really interesting uh, interesting project. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's also, you know, everything has a development process and that's been interesting to watch because it's been cast and recast and and um for the better and for the best and so uh, that's another one i'm looking forward to seeing on the screen i think lots of potential what is your biggest challenge um in work mm, reading the market before the market can be read meaning you know it takes so many years to put these projects together and you know the quickest a film can ever come together is you know a couple of years and on the outside, a decade. So when you start out identifying what it is you want to do, for what budget, where and how, um, that's reading the, the tea leaves of the current market and what's available. But that's not really what it's going to look like when you release it. So mm -hmm. you have to constantly um, try to herald the future. <laughs> and that's a little bit tricky. You know, if you would have seen the market, let's say three years ago, four years ago, along with the rest of the United States and the world, everyone was very high on debt financing. On debt financing? Debt financing, yeah. And so you everyone, buy someone's debt? Uh, meaning that putting together the financing model doesn't necessarily comprise 100% of private equity, uh, meaning capital, but you leverage that through lending. Uh, traditionally with institutional lenders. And the banks, how the banks would lend is based on what pre-sales estimates that Boy, I just, I should have, have watched CNBC before this whole thing. <laughs> you, you totally, or MSNBC, you know. <laughs> All right, let's go, ba let's go back to... Uh... <laughs> well, the point is the debt is no longer available. So now you oh. see the way projects are being put together is it's a dramatic shift in the financing patterns. And a lot of projects had to fall by the wayside because they, you know, were susceptible to not planning for uh, that inevitability that the, the debt market would be suffering. And also we have this new thing called VOD. Mm. Oh, yeah. Huge, huge, huge on the horizon. That's the big thing to watch. That's the, that's the next big thing. Well, ultra VOD, uh, also understood as multiple platform. Or like your Hulu and YouTube. and Well, specifically, um, Radius. Um, the Weinstein groups, the, the Weinstein companies, new new offshoot called Radius. And what they do, or how you may have heard of them, is um, by way of example, the film Bachelorette. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Kristen Dunn. I didn't and, see it, but I think I've heard of it, yeah. Well, it just hit number one on, um, on iTunes. And this is before it was ever re released theatrically. You know, it was released um, in, a, in a different platform, and hence the term multi-platform multi releases. And it's, uh, it's performed incredibly well. Um, I think it's released theatrically, I believe, this weekend, and it's already generated $4 million-plus for um, the distributor, for Radius, um, wow. without them ever having to incur this massive print and advertising, the marketing spend, that traditionally you would have to make that investment into trying to get butts into seats in theaters. Yeah, I just heard a piece on the radio today that uh, uh, one of the – I don't know if it's Fox or who's – but they're going to actually release it on demand before they mm -hmm. sell it to the DVD. Yeah, um, yeah. that's exactly the it. The Polish brothers did it with their film, the yeah. last film that they did. They 
produced yeah. it and ran it on, uh, yeah. I think it was called Paris or I Love Paris or... Could be. Paris again. <laughs> I've seen some of their stuff, not all yeah, their stuff. Yeah, no, I love those guys. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. I mean, it kind of, this this release model kind of got everyone's attention because of Margin Call. And that was the Lionsgate Roadside uh, Attractions release last, or when was that, year or two, is it two years now? But the point is it did very successfully. And that was day and date, meaning you're releasing it on more than one platform at a time. But this ultra VOD model is actually, it releases it, um, and it predates the release before the theatrical mm. on uh, on VOD. So big changes, and yeah. it, it allows certain films to really get out there, as opposed to having executives just say, "Well, we re- we just don't have the P and A allocated, and that's going to go into the dustbin." <laughs> basically, you know, this is giving a lot of films uh, an extra shot at making it into uh, you know to, through the audience experience. So, how would somebody? contact you if they wanted to hire your services how how, how does that process work do um, they pitch you the idea and you say oh, i like that or yeah well it depends what a specific service they would need um oh you're like the were... little engine that could okay <laughs> come on kid i'll give you a chance <laughs> well i i recommend that they first you know take a look at the website of uh, what we do and let me give that address to it's a uh, good low law yes or yeah good low law.com good low law.com and, uh, you know, assuming that although we do provide a vast array of services, uh, assuming that they fall into those that category of service, um, they, the contact information is there and they should just they're welcome to send an email and someone will be responsive to them and um, highly likely will be asking for their information about their projects, be they on the talent side or um, on the investor side, you know, we'll, we'll ask the questions that need to be asked at the time. Now, there are also this thing about, because you have to walk kind of a fine line too. If somebody just sends you unsolicited material, yeah, you know, cause there's all kinds of yeah. you know, lawsuits <laughs> that happen, right? I mean, that's your expertise, but sure. how do you deal with those issues that is there stuff that you won't open because it's unsolicited? I mean, um, well, you know, I spend a lot of my time explaining what a film finance attorney actually does. I don't finance films. I'm not an investor. And no. a lot of people actually approach the practice thinking that we are, you know, some level of financier. We're not. But this intellectual property, that's very big. Right. Yes. And so, I mean, what we are known for doing is identifying what financing model works best for the subject matter for the intellectual property, meaning, you know, what's the right budget? What sort of resources do you need to tap into? What's the least amount of private equity you need to raise? And then how do we find non-equity funding to be able to offset that and bridge the the gap and the shortfall? And that's, you know, again, tax credits, deferring talent deals, pre-sales, um, and if you can qualify for a debt financing. So we, we help – we open up our network, we introduce p- our clients, but um, – and we, we help provide financing solutions. But we ourselves are not investors. What is this whole thing about – because I – there was a film that came out, Star Maps, and I remember talking – Miguel Arteta, it was like his first film. Mm-hmm. And then it's all about how um, – you know, they, they put up this money, but the, the studio's never in the, you know, they're never in the black, so the people never get paid. What is mm-hmm. that all about? I mean, is, is that fairly rampant in Hollywood? Well, I think perhaps what you could be referring to is the, the marketing of a film, the P&A, print and advertising. So um, very quickly, the waterfall of recoupment really starts at distribution costs and expenses, and that's the, the cost for prints and the cost for advertising, and mm-hmm. these are the big ticket items. So let's just say that you have a film that costs $10, 10 million or $10 or whatever, 10x. The cost to market that movie properly could exceed the budget itself. And the investors and filmmakers and collaborators don't see any returns until the P&A is repaid to the studios or the P&A lender, whoever that may be, or the P&A financier. So... Oftentimes, when there is a disproportionate spend to performance at box office, the film will make money. The, the P&A investors will recoup with a margin, with a preferred return, but the uh, investors and filmmakers will not. And, and that's time. something you can protect the filmmaker? That is among some of the things that we do, yes. Yeah, nice. That's <laughs> yeah. good because they're out there. You know, they come up with the idea and all the hard work and everything, and then, yeah. you know, they max out their credit cards or whatever. Tell me about uh, some of the ways that people raise funds. I know that uh, Kickstarter is one. 
Sure. Well, there's Kickstarter. Uh, you and I were discussing before the show. There's Indiegogo. Indiegogo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there is, you know, the traditional way of, of raising funds through a private placement, um, and that is by selling securities in the company that holds the intellectual property. And, uh, you know, you raise your private equity that way. Um, and how you get to investors, you know, there's, there's no magic bullet. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, I've, I've seen and heard of so many different and innovative ways from getting the talent to do cocktail parties. And then people, you know, if they love the talent, if they're smitten by them, they tend to pull out their checkbooks. Um, setting, going to where the um, circles of influence for wealth purposes are in locally in the United States or, or abroad. So, you know, I've seen success stories come out of um, events ha- hosted at country clubs in Ohio or, um, you know, uh, where else? God, somewhere in Florida, I forget now. Sarasota, just uh, a lot of investors out there checkbooks um, because that was one where they happened to fly talent there. And and there is not a lot of other uh, media investment opportunities that have the sexy that I mentioned. So um, the people were interested in it. You know, mm-hmm. it's you're not going to it's very difficult to find private equity in L.A. because all we have here is entertainment and everyone's chasing those investors. Right. Same thing for New York. Same thing for you know Miami, a lot of the obvious big cities. But if you go to other places that, you know, represent high net worth individuals that are not as infiltrated as LA is, your chances greatly increase. So just food for thought. Well, nice. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming up and uh, sharing some insight into that. And once again, um, if you'd like more information, the web address is goodloelaw.com. It's G-O-O-D-L-O-E-L-A-W.com. We've been talking with Bianca Goodlow. And, uh, Thanks she, so much for having me. one of the managing partners. And is it true you speak like 50 different languages? Uh, not 50, No, you do. Several. Huh? <laughs> F- 50 different languages. Well, English is my third. I, I, English is your th- I can barely... <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to ramp up to English being my first. Thank you very much. Well, my pleasure. Just a reminder, you can hear Center Stage Live every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on KXLU Los Angeles, 88.9 FM. We're also streaming live on the Internet at KXLU.com. Until next time, this is Mark Gordon, and I'll see you Center Stage.